Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for coming tonight. We have taken on a project by the Evergreen Pathfinders, a group of gentlemen that meet every Wednesday morning here in town for self-education, also education for the community, and to make Evergreen a better place to live. Uh, we have tonight, we've invited some dignitaries here to speak to you from a national, regional, state, and local governments and entities and organizations. And I think that you're going to hear some information tonight that you're going to like very, very much. How are we doing here? Getting everyone settled? All right. Tonight, we're not going to accept any questions or comments from the floor in, in, due to the fact we want everything to move as quickly as possible. But we will have tables set over the north wall and behind there where these speakers are going to be meeting and we'll take questions for about a half an hour or so over there and they all have literature for you that I'm sure that you'll be very interested in receiving. Well, our timekeeper says it's time to go. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we want to introduce the first speaker, Dean Dalvin. And Dean, where are you, my friend? Dean is, well, I'm going to let Dean introduce himself and his position. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm the president of the Downtown Evergreen Economic District. My role and our role in that organization is primarily to improve or create missing infrastructure in downtown Evergreen. Uh, as we're not an incorporated town, we play the role of the not-for-profit volunteer organization that, uh, that replaces the, uh, uh, the, the city manager of what would otherwise be a, a town. So we, we're focused on things like sidewalks, pedestrian connectivity, um, uh, parking, and, and things of that nature. Uh, Jim asked me to come and speak today specifically about uh, after the flood and what what is the status of things in downtown Evergreen after the, the flooding events that we had uh, this late summer and uh, I can I can sum it up uh, actually fortunately in under five minutes because that's all I have here but um, the uh, the flood in, in Evergreen was was certainly event an event but it, for any of you who actually uh, got to witness the, the waters flowing through the creek while incredible, um, huge volumes of, of water and something that uh, is, is somewhat abstract to even get your head to wrap around. The, the creek itself actually did a pretty good job containing the waters. Um, it, uh, the flooding that we saw at Cactus Jacks, which is one of the primary uh, businesses hit in downtown, was largely due to the fact that the bridge upstream was uh, trapping tree, a tree and, uh, and subsequently debris that diverted the river around the bridge and directly into the uh, Cactus Jacks parking lot in their front door. So that's, that's why they, uh, they saw the damage that they did. Fortunately, um, the building owner uh, is insured for flood insurance. They're rebuilding. Um, they're looking to come back uh, stronger than ever, so we're really excited about that. Um, further downstream on the south side of the river, the uh, Evergreen Metro District certainly had their hands full because with all the damage up Upper Bear Creek, um, their entire uh, sewer system filled up with floodwaters and they spent a good couple weeks there just dealing with that. Um, seems to have subsided, but I still think they've got quite a bit of uh, storm flow in their, in their systems. Um, and then uh, probably the largest area of damage uh, from the flood happened down across from the CenturyLink building where there is a retaining wall, or was a retaining wall, that uh, retained about a 20 space parking, sp uh, parking lot down on that end of town. And the entire wall, uh, the hydrostatic pressure from the flood got behind the wall. The wall was already failing, um, it had been failing for, for quite a number of years. And uh, in this particular flood event, the water, enough water got behind the wall to, to push it literally into the creek. Um, at this point, our role with the Downtown Evergreen Economic District, DEED for short, so I refer to DEED uh, so I can save myself as speaking of all, that, all those words. Uh, we're working hard to get all of the stakeholders to the table. Um, interestingly enough, that, that partic particular piece of property has a, uh, 
somewhat of a, a dormant history of ownership. And in fact, after the flood, there's a discovery process of trying to figure out who exactly owns the property and how do we work together to, to move forward with a solution that will repair what needs repairing there, which is both the stream channel as well as the parking, as well as to create uh, hopefully an amenity for downtown Evergreen rather than an eyesore. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the, the property ownership has been somewhat uh, of a question that while deeds have been transferred in the past, um, the question at this point is without the proper re recordation of those deeds and even the proper writing of those legal descriptions, um, we have a number of players that are, that are concerned about what to, uh, what to do there. So we're working hard on getting those folks to the table and um, it's going to involve Colorado Department of Transportation, CenturyLink, the Evergreen National Bank, uh, which is owned by the Ross Lewis Trust, and, and ourselves, Dean, to, to work towards that. Um, in short, I can sum up the, the flood activity in downtown Evergreen in one basic idea, and that is that it put an exclamation point on the very serious need for better infrastructure in our downtown. Um, that is beyond anything else, something we need to focus on as a community, and something that we're focusing on as, as deed. Moving forward, downtown is open for business. A lot of people have asked me, well, what, what can we do to help? Um, the best thing you can do right now to help is to come downtown and spend your dollars because the, the greatest losses were loss of business during, during the period of the flood and the aftermath of the flood when sandbags were pretty much uh, covering downtown. So um, please come downtown. In the meantime, uh, we're moving forward with other projects and uh, that includes the trail to connect the lake to downtown, which if you'd like to learn more about that, we're, uh, we're set up over here on the side of the, um, on the, side of the, the seating here. Thank you so much. Dean started, Dean and his group started something quite some time ago, and it was a 1%, not tax, I don't want you to think tax, but a voluntary donation to your bill on any uh, bill that you, or from any uh, downtown store or business. That money, and Dean, how much have you collected so far in a year or less? Over $50,000 of your contributions, 1% over the bills that you have accrued downtown has gone through downtown improvements. So you know most of that money is going to go to flood damage and flood repair. So when you hear about that 1% or when they ask you about that 1%, would you care to donate? Feel generous, it's your town, it's your downtown and Dean will put it to real good use. Thanks, Dean. Our next speaker is a, a man in this community who has helped the, this group, the uh, Evergreen Pathfinders, quite a bit by donating this building that you're sitting in here tonight. Scott Robson, the Executive Director of Evergreen Parks and Rec, believes very strongly in building up the community and helping the community move in positive directions. And so for groups like ours and nonprofit groups, uh, talk to Scott and instead of that very large sum that they charge for weddings and whatnot here, uh, you might get the building free. So I'm putting Scott on the, uh, on, on the hot spot here. But Scott Robinson, come on up, buddy, and talk to us about Evergreen Parks and Rec. Thank you, Jim. I, I really do appreciate the Pathfinders uh, putting on this event tonight. Uh, this is really a, just a great uh, example of uh, just community participation, and, and glad to be here as the Executive Director of Evergreen Park and Rec District. Um, we do indeed really try our best to, to make this facility, your lake house, uh, free and, and open to uh, these kind of community events at, at no charge. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum would be uh, uh, the weddings and some of those private parties, but that really helps us fund a lot of other things within the district. So uh, what I want to do uh, this evening as briefly as I can um, is just reflect on what's been going on in the, uh, over the course of the summer within the district here, uh, talk about a few things upcoming this winter and then where we're going in the future. So 
I would frame uh, this this summer as a continued focus on improving what we already have within this community for the, for the district. Within our uh, eight uh, primary parks within the district, our two major rec centers, the lake house here and the lake. Really, uh, since I've been here over the last two and a half years, um, we have uh, really tried to focus on improving what we have rather than going out and building and acquiring a lot of new stuff, if you will. And I think it's been working well. Um, we are a district based more than any other, I would say, in the state on partnerships. And we really have close partnerships more than ever, I think, with Jefferson County. Uh, we have Ralph Shell and, and uh, Sheriff Mink here tonight. Uh, we partner very closely with the city of Denver, uh, Jeffco School District, and with our nonprofit community. Um, we are nothing without our partnerships. And so this summer, I think you've seen uh, probably a lot of those partnerships come to fruition um, in some of the uh, programs we've been offering, uh, special events at this park and other parks around the, the district, and it's it's very, very important to us, and, and my work is to try to continue to grow those partnerships. Um, at the lake in particular, you've probably seen uh, a, a new, very popular stand-up paddleboard uh, program out here. We've launched some master swimmer uh, programs <coughs> in the lake, thanks to our partnership with the uh, Green Metro District. Um, and, and really brought some new, I think, interesting activities to the lake in itself. Um, but along with that, um, we continue to see more activity than ever from both locals using the lake and uh, folks from the front range using the lake. And with that comes some pressures uh, as far as managing this property in particular. So I want to talk very briefly about what we're what we're doing already this year and next year in regards to managing, uh, I think, the ever increasing use of this uh, really crown jewel of Evergreen. And in 2014, you'll see us move from a pilot ranger program into a permanent park ranger program for 2014 to do some uh, patrols around the lake to really. Uh, they're not going out and ticketing and, and doing a lot of law enforcement, but very much educating and, and talking to folks about how to use this place responsibly. So we're going to formalize and make a permanent park ranger program for the first time ever next year. Uh, again, we continue to work uh, more and more closely with Jeff Sheriff on some of the parking issues along the Bear Creek and around the lake. Um, and we will uh, grow our partnerships with the Evergreen Nature Center here at the lake, which we host within our uh, old boathouse forming that, uh, and with folks like Leadership Evergreen to put out new educational signage and uh, really put out information about how to use this great resource responsibly. Uh, we don't want to necessarily back off from inviting people to this great resource, but we know it's going to take ever-increasing management of this delicate resource to make sure uh, we protect it. Um, along with that, we, in our 2014 budget, are continuing to invest within trail improvements, fencing to keep folks out of wetlands, uh, more dog bag dispensers, all that fun stuff um, that you really need um, as you're using our lake. And, um, and we think that's important. Part of that, too, as far as a management uh, perspective next year, we'll be looking at a cap, really, for the first time, of the special events at Lake Park. We really feel like we have hit a carrying capacity here that we need to keep focused on very closely. We want to continue to be that um, source of support for our nonprofits who hold a lot of fundraisers and so on um, at our parks, but we're going to continue to work to spread those out to some of the underutilized parks within the district, such as Buchanan or Marshdale, Kittredge, whatever it might be, to try to start to take a little bit of that pressure. Lake Park, but continue to uh, continue to invite folks here because this is your resource, this is a public resource. Ultimately, it's owned by the city of Denver, and we have no uh, management responsibility. So that's a bit of a reflection on what's going on this summer. Really, the, the biggest project that's been going on this summer is Wolf Park, which is the park next to Wolf Rec Center. We're going to uh, cut the ribbon on that this Saturday, uh, and thanks to Jeffco Open Space Funds uh, and others. Uh, Considerable dollars from our own EPR accounts. We're improving a 40 year old park into just a fantastic resource throughout this summer. So that's been a great uh, project for us to, to move forward on. Um, what you've probably seen in the, in the local newspaper, and maybe even some of you got some calls or took the online survey, 
but our board uh, and uh, administration <coughs> launched a community survey early this summer. We have the results back, and we'll be distributing those final results out to the community. But it very much focused on Buchanan Park, Buchanan Rec Center, uh, and some hot button issues around the district. And what we learned from that is that on the north side of Buchanan Park, where it's really open space, ponderosa pine forest, folks would like to see that preserved as such, really no changes. As you move towards Buchanan Rec Center, folks would uh, like to see uh, some improvements around the, the ponds themselves, uh, improvement and probably relocation of the uh, uh, playground down around Buchanan Rec Center. <coughs> And also some potential expansion of the Buchanan Rec Center to add something like a gym, some more fitness areas, things along those lines. So we're going to kick off a little feasibility study uh, this winter and into the spring to see what that might look like, what the cost might be, and what the cost benefit might be of what additional programs we might bring in. But that was very interesting, we thought, and helpful for us as a uh, and our board. Um, one of the more interesting pieces of that survey as well was how do people feel about the use of this lake and this lake park? We've heard a lot about there's too much use of the lake, there's not enough. Ultimately, that, that community survey came back and 81% of the community felt like uh, we're programming this park at about the right level. 12% um, of the folks said you're not programming enough events here at the lake. And 7% of the community came back and said uh, you're overusing this park, there's too much going on. So we take that back in, we take it with a grain of salt, but also um, uh, we feel like we're hitting about the right level of programming here at the lake, but we also know that we've got to manage this place responsibly from an environmental standpoint and a parking standpoint in particular. For this winter, uh, we've got a number of things coming up, and that really, uh, this winter, is focusing on um, Evergreen Golf Course. We're working very uh, closely with the city of Denver to move forward a concept that's been out there a while, and that is to bring forward some uh, winter sports activities, and that means uh, a tubing hill uh, for the public, um, cross-country skiing, and some snowshoeing at, at the Evergreen uh, golf course. And again, that's not going to happen until we get some final approvals from the city of Denver, but we think it's going to be a fantastic new winter resource to make this really a, a winter sports um, uh, center for Evergreen's community. And do it at a very low cost point, we think, for our, our community, but bring something new again for our community. Um, we will uh, continue to put on uh, things like our pond hockey tournament, ice bike race, and ice fishing tournament, but we're very excited about what's going to go on hopefully this, this winter. In the spring, uh, Dean Dowd already mentioned, um, we're, we're helping partner on um, this new trail connection that'll be more or less a, a ramp, no stairs, to be able to connect from the dam into downtown Evergreen Underpass, and that's going to be also not just a great resource, but an economic development issue. And so, um, with that, I, I, I would just want to wrap up here, and get the red sign back there, that um, we're very excited about these projects moving forward. We continue to have a focus on hiring our local businesses, hiring our local contractors. I think uh, this year, the numbers I got back was 163 different businesses we hired through the Evergreen Park and Rec District um, for uh, contracting work, work within our rec centers, and this year we put in, I believe, $3.6 million back into the local Evergreen economy through our payroll and through businesses we're hiring. So we're really excited to continue to grow that, continue to grow the programs um, and the projects that we're putting forward for you as the community. And uh, we're really excited about what's what's coming up here in 2014. Um, I, again, appreciate Pathfinders uh, inviting me here tonight. We'll um, hope to see some of you, if not all of you, at uh, Saturday morning's ribbon cutting up at Wolf Park, where we'll kick off uh, the opening of that brand new park. So thank you. Appreciate it. I don't know if you people really realize that Evergreen Parks and Rec proselyted Scott when he was with Denver, City and County of Denver. And may I add, Scott, that you were the assistant director for all the parks and rec for the city and county of Denver. So we got a tremendously experienced gentleman up here, and you can hear tonight how effective he's become and how effective he will become 
And Scott, thank you very much for hitting a couple of hot buttons about patrolling and traffic and everything tonight that are out there. Appreciate it. You know, at this time, I would like to take a break and introduce some of the dignitaries that are with us tonight and that have come and will be available for talking to you after the meeting. And I want to start with Lou Diorio. Lou, where are you? Raise your hand. Let's not have applause, but Lou's back there and running for Jefferson County Assessor. Cedric Willis. Cedric, where are you, guy? Oh, way back. Stand up, would you please, so people can see him. He's from FEMA, and FEMA came up here to help us with the flooding projects. And Cedric, we're very happy to have you here. And Ralph Shell in the back, your Jefferson County Administrator. There's the guy who puts all the packages together and sees that they move as smoothly as possible. And Margaret Herzog, where are you, Margaret? All right, <laughs> okay. Margaret is with the Bear Creek Watershed Association, so she's got a hand in the pie, too, with the flooding that went on. And Jeff Schrader, Jeff, I know you're here. There you are, guy, hold your hand up again. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to meet, and we're going to lose an icon uh, in this county when term limited uh, sheriff or sheriff uh, goes away, unfortunately, next fall. And Jeff Schrader is going to be candidate for sheriff at that time. And I might add, this is not an endorsement, only informational, that he has been with every department within the sheriff's department and has headed him up and has had some terrific experience in doing so. And John Ellis, John, are you here? Does everyone know the mayor of, of Evergreen? <laughs> The, the jolly red leprechaun over there, John Ellis. Hey, Jim, one thing I need to mention on Saturday, that big, big thing that's going on at the Wolf Rec Center, part of that that is being done is the pavilion for Gene Younger that was the memorial for him for the Building Trades Program for 26 homes built in Evergreen on behalf of Blue Bruce Kiwanis. So come up and see how cool the park is, the playground, and there's robbers, so uh, there's a reason to <laughs> Have you ever seen John miss a commercial opportunity? No, no, no. Is Doug Bell here? Doug Bell isn't with us. I want to state tonight that Doug Bell, the uh, editor of the Canyon Courier and the Evergreen newspapers, has been prodding us, pushing us, cajoling us, thanking us and whatnot for putting the, putting the second town hall meeting on. And it was successful the first time we listened to your surveys or, or, or read your surveys that are on the seats. And we made a lot of changes tonight, which I hope you'll appreciate. But Doug was behind a lot of this and has helped us in advertising and the stories in the Canyon Courier. So we thank Doug very, very much. Next, I want to ask your hosts tonight, members of the Evergreen Pathfinders, if they wouldn't stand up, please. Be acknowledged, recognized. Come on, guys, let's all stand up. Evergreen Pathfinders. They worked very hard to make this meeting for you tonight a success. Sharon Smith, where are you, my dear? Come on up. Sharon said that she doesn't have much to say. It's going to be very short and tight. <laughs> she warned us when she first came in, hang on, guys, because here we go. Sharon, and with the Evergreen Christian Outreach, which we all know as ECHO, a fantastic organization in this community. Coordinated enough to um, work the little buzzer and talk at the same time, so I have to be able to see what the the slides are here. 
what I decided to do was do a little bit of a PowerPoint because otherwise I could talk for hours about the wonderful things we do at ECHO. So I am limited and I'm watching that sign back there. So I thought I'd give a little overview of who we are, what we're doing, and some of the good programs that we have going on, and the number of folks that we are serving here in our mountain community. First, our mission, the mission of ECHO, is to provide assistance to residents of the Evergreen Mountain communities who are unemployed, underemployed, <coughs> dealing with a long-term illness, or experience other forms of personal crisis. So anyone that has any type of issues, they are welcome to come into ECHO. We were founded in 1986 when two churches decided that they needed some, wanted to help some people in the area for food and clothing and their basic needs. Other churches soon joined in, and in 1989, we were incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. The purpose from our bylaws was basically to follow the commands of Christ, to feed the hungry, give thirst to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick and imprisoned, and to love one another as he has loved us. Our goal or vision, while we do meet the most basic and urgent needs of individuals when they come in, we're looking to help individuals work towards and attain self-sufficiency and sustainability, whatever that may mean for them. Um, our programs, we have a food bank, clothing assistance, resale shop, client services is a big component, and we have our new job center. Our food bank is a model for most of the other food banks here in the area, so we're very proud of that. We use a client-served model uh, what that means is that clients can come in and shop for their own food. They're not just given a box of food and sent on their way. So they get to pick and choose. And we're also modeling under healthy living and healthy choices. What used to be the food pyramid, which we all remember from school, is now the plate. So that's what we base all the food on. We've also determined that there is a large uh, need for food programs specifically for children in this area. We do have a large number of students who are receiving free or reduced lunches at school. In the summer, we had our summer lunch program. The having kids home in the summer does put a, a bind on people's budgets, and particularly when they're already stretched. We had 87 participants for this past summer, and they were basically given enough food to provide lunches for the week. We're now implementing the backpack program, which is a program that's implemented in several different areas, including the Conifer area, where students will receive a backpack of food on a Friday afternoon that is delivered to the school, and that is food for them for the weekend. We currently, we are partnering with Evergreen Lutheran Church and the Evergreen Rotary. We have one school that is participating right now, which is Parmalee, and we're looking to add uh, Wilmot probably around the first of the year. So this is our first year doing this. In the summer, we did have a, a fundraiser, and basically $10 per month can make a difference. That will provide backpack lunches for one student for the entire month. Holiday meals, uh, we do provide holiday meals for families. We average about 200 households is what we provide our holiday meals. We'll be coming up with for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. Here's our food bank numbers. The average number of households served each month is 285 individual households that come into ECHO. That translates to the number of folks that we are feeding during the month, 1,169 adults and 534 children. The average amount of food donated per month is 19,008 pounds each month comes into ECHO. So far for the year, we've had 171,000 79 pounds delivered and handed out. And of course, you know, we're only, that's till the end of September. The average number of visits per day to ECHO for the food bank is 51. Um, and we are open four days a week. Clothing assistance, uh, we do provide clothing assistance. We have St. Raphael's, which is our kind of clothing store for clients and small appliances. We'll have holiday gifts at our St. Nick's coming up here um, in December. Client services is kind of the core of the part of the ECHO programs. We offer financial assistance, we have education programs, the ECHO Job Center, and child care subsidy. 
financial assistance in 2012, we provided, we paid out in direct financial services and goods a total of $662,094.38. So that is a combination between food and actual financial assistance to individuals. And that was given out, the financial, financial assistance goes out in rent, um, auto, phone, medical assistance, and utilities. Utilities alone, we probably spent about fifty-five thousand last year helping individuals with utility bills. Education programs. We determined that helping individuals move towards self-sufficiency and sustainability is very important. We're now offering budgeting classes. We have a divorce group, uh, tuition and education assistance funding. So we will help people get the skills needed to move on to better-paying jobs. We have an adult literacy program, which will be uh, starting up here in partnership with the Evergreen Rotary. And we do make referrals to other agencies and programs. Share the Care is a program unique to ECHO. That is our child care subsidy program. So we are helping with the cost for child care for working parents. Um, that is kind of the, we're one of the only programs up here in the mountains. I think last year it was probably about 35,000 of which we helped um, with child care and subsidy. Echo Job Center, we're pretty excited about this. This has been go ongoing now for a year. We have monthly workshops for job seekers. We started out for Echo clients. It is now open to the general public. Anyone who is looking, who is unemployed, or looking for a job or looking for a better job. We have one-on-one -on -one job coaches. This is probably one of the biggest success stories for our program. Uh, we have a best foot forward career closet, so we can outfit individuals if they're going for job interviews, or once they get the job, we have career clothes for them. We now have an online website for employers and job seekers, so we have Echo Jobs, and we're getting more and more employers who are calling us and we're posting that as a free service for businesses. We will have a free job fair for the Mountain Area Businesses and Job Seekers November 7th. It will be at the Wolf Rec Center. We are working together and we work hand in hand with the Pathfinders. We love you guys. Uh, they are the driving force behind our Echo Job Center. We could not do this without the Pathfinders. They, are, they, they put on the day-long program. It's an eight to four program for, to get people ready for jobs. We provide lunch, so it's always a big incentive to come and get a free lunch. And the guys do a great job. We talk about resumes, getting people ready for the job. We've had uh, Walmart or Home Depot will send some of their HR people to practice interviewing. So it's a great program. And the biggest success is that about 50% of the people who have gone through our program have gotten jobs. So it is just, you know, it's, it's, it's a great program. Here's for the Echo Jobs Fair that'll be coming up November 7th. Another little thing, I gotta kick this into gear. Echo Resale Shop is another major component of Echo. Um, you know, the items sold in the shop are donated from community members. All proceeds from Echo Resale are used for, um, to fund our client programs. And we're going to be using the Echo Resale Shop to train and assist job seekers get the skills that they need, perhaps if they're going into the retail business. So extending a hand to our mountain neighbors in need. This is a number of, ec of visits to Echo per year for the last four years. And you can see it's been a steady increase. In 2009, we had, oh, I think it was, uh, it was a little over 6,000 visits that, that came in through the year. Last year, it was 9,687 visits. So we have seen a steady increase and the number of unique households that have been served by ECHO, and that's whether it's one individual or a family, went from 234 in 2009 up to 657 last year. So the numbers are tremendous. Homeless and Evergreen, we do have homeless people. We see on average, you know, 49 to 55 individuals are living in their car, camping up here, or couch surfing in the Evergreen area. Um, the number of homeless people in Jefferson County, there's enough to fill 62 school buses. So if you need a visual, that's on any given night. 
where the funding comes from, individuals, resale, community organizations, by far, individual donations in the community is what supports ECHO. You can support us by volunteering, donating, uh, financial assistance, supporting our programs. One more time. <laughs> Upcoming events, Nine Cares Food Drive will be November 16th, King Supers. That benefits directly the Echo Food Bank. We'll have the Turkey Trot coming up Thanksgiving morning, Echo Job Fair, Echo Workshop, November 14th, 8 to 4. Enjoy the needs a job. Thanksgiving morning, the Turkey Trot. And thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Sharon, you ran off on me. We've got two gentlemen here in the Pathfinders group that worked with ECHO and started the jobs fair and started the uh, program helping people find jobs, schooling them, training them how to interview, also having donated clothing so they can dress properly and so on and so forth. And is Bruce Thomes back there? Raise your hand. Where's Bruce? Stand up, Bruce, please. And Ken Carlson behind the lectern. These are the two gentlemen that Sharon spoke about that, that uh, worked those programs and created them with, with uh, Echo. Mike Ouija, where are you, my friend? Come on up. Mike is the Evergreen Fire Department Chief. And Mike has got a lot of stories to tell us about, about the recent uh, uh, forest fires and the flood. Mike Boyji, Chief of the Evergreen Fire Department. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Pathfinder, for having me here tonight. Um, I'm actually here to talk tonight about our next our 10-year strategic plan that we've started working on. Um, Evergreen, as you know, continues to change, has changed a lot in the last 10 years through our last strategic plan, uh, not to mention the last 50 years, the growth, uh, the increase in call volume and how it affects the fire department. Uh, Evergreen, the fire department has to change in tune with the community. We have to keep pace. Uh, it's a very difficult task. And, the gentleman who built the last 10 year plan for us did an excellent job recognizing the community change. And um, I want to go through just some of the things we have accomplished over the last 10 to 12 years uh, with the help of two million increases in a bond that were approved by the community uh, very graciously. Um, we quite a few construction projects. We've doubled the size of the fire stations we have. We originally had four. Uh, now we have eight. And we uh, bought apparatus and equipment to house in those fire stations. One out at Station 5, which is west on Upper Bear by Echo Lake Drive. Uh, station 6 in Kittredge. Station 7 out at Jeffco 65 on the highway. And Station 8 up at Forest Estates on Foot Forest Road. Um, Equipping our responders out in those remote regions, trying to cover 125 square mile district has greatly improved our response. Uh, we built the, there's quite a bit of construction in uh, the Station 2 area, the admin building. Uh, we used to have our admin facility at Station 1 by the dam. We moved up to Station 2 in the new building, which is also a community use building and a training building. I believe there were almost 325 uses last year that building by the community. Um, we built a maintenance facility to maintain all the apparatus that we have now. Um, we also are contracted out by our surrounding districts to maintain their apparatus, so that's a small revenue point for us. Um, and we remodeled the original station too. We put sleeping quarters in upstairs for the medics. We're there 24-7. We expanded our dispatch center, and we expanded our water sources. We put cisterns in around the district, namely Station 5 with 40,000 gallons, Station 8 with 40,000 gallons. Less than 10% of the district is hydrant, so we carry our water everywhere we go. Um, and last but not least, we just replaced our old single-story, single-room training building with the new state-of-the-art building. Fire 
organizations. These guys, have, they're asked, we ask a lot of these guys, uh, our volunteer corps, we really have to concentrate on retention and um, recruitment. Uh, we need these guys, and we need them all over the district. Uh, we like to have somewhere near 90 firefighters. We have about 75, 78 firefighters right now. Um, these guys are they're all trained to a state level firefighter one. We train them to a national incident management system to help us on these big incidents like the flood where we're bringing in um, state and federal agencies like wildfires. Uh, we're concentrating heavily on wildfire, on structured fire, and on rescue with extrication, swift and flat water rescue, and our medical response. Communications, we um, we're, have two dispatchers on 24-7. Both, all our dispatchers are emergency medical dispatch trained, so they'll stay on the phone with a caller and help with a medical, medical emergency until our responders can get there. Uh, we recently migrated from our old UHF radio system to a VHF radio system, which is what most of our neighbors are on, so that's going to help with our interoperability substantially. Uh, that was a four-year program, mostly funded through <coughs> federal grant. EMS, we now operate with four um, ALS paramedics. In the past, we had just a paramedic and EMT on each ambulance. With four paramedics, we can now run four ALS calls within the district with the help of our volunteers. What's an ALS? Advanced Life Support. I'm sorry. Uh, fire prevention. We put a lot of time and effort into what happened before the incident, training, educating the community uh, with uh, things like safety days, school visits. Um, Extinguisher training for, for businesses and for the schools and yearly inspections of all the commercial buildings in the district. And we've also built three plants on all the commercial buildings in the district. Uh, other things we've accomplished with, with our insurance services office audit, the ISO audit we went through, we were able to reduce our insurance rating from a 5, 9, 10 to a 5, 6, 10, which is a substantial savings in insurance to a lot of the community. Um, we also put a lot of effort into developing a long-term apparatus replacement plan and facilities maintenance plan, looking out 20 years of making sure we have money available 20 years from now to help continue to increase the service that we can provide. Um, with our new strategic plan, how we're going about this is we're developing a statement of coverage, a scope of coverage, which will tell us how well we did placing these stations around the district and if we have any open holes yet. Um, and a risk assessment which identifies throughout the district where our highest risks are and what incidents are our highest risks. We know wildfire is by far our highest risk in the district. So we're putting, we're planning on putting a lot more effort into education and community on wildfire. We're, we put together a focus group made up of community members and we've selected community members who are also in groups like Pathfinders or the Chamber of Commerce. And that focus group is going to be tasked with helping us build this strategic plan. They're going to be given assignments to take back to their, their community, their HOAs, their groups they belong with, to try and get input from those groups and bring it back to us to help us build this plan. Now, uh, one big project that we know is on the forefront is replacing Station 1 by the dam. That station was built in 1965. The space there is very limited. There's no parking for the firefighters. The apron out in front of the station is barely big enough for current fire trucks to pull out. So it's really not the best location for that station right now. So relocating or remodeling that station is going to be a big priority in this next plan. Um, as I mentioned, our call volume continues to increase. In 1995, we ran just under 1,400 calls. Um, this year, we're looking at topping 2,400 calls. So the call volume continues to grow. The, the buildings around the district residential construction has slowed quite a bit, but what we see is the old cabins that everybody's used to are being torn down and replaced by very large houses. Um, those houses are very difficult to fight in a fire. Um, a lot more commercial structures going up, so our firefighters are being asked to do a lot more with the size of the buildings in the district. Uh, 
so to sum up, our focus for, the, for our, our long-term plan is really to uh, provide and strive for continuing high level of service to this community. Um, recognize community growth and how we can adapt to it. Evaluate and recognize the high risk areas and high risk incidents that we have in our district and pre-plan for those and train for those. And recruitment and retention of our volunteer system. That to me is imperative for having as many volunteers in our fire department. It's incredibly important. Thank you. Mike Winchy, when you talk about the guys on the fire department, I know that includes women also. How many women firefighters are with you right now? There's actually 10, I believe. 10? That's amazing. That's great. That's wonderful. That's great. Before we invite Don Rozier up here, I want to draw your attention to a survey that we put on each and every chair. Would you please take that out? We've stole a lot of pens, borrowed a lot of pens, went to banks and uh, kind of confiscated some on their counters and everything. So uh, we would have writing instruments for you people to work on these surveys. So as we go along this morning, would you please make your comments there? Because it was from last year that we heard from eight speakers, you want six. You want 10 minutes for each one to speak instead of the ones we had last year at five. We heard that, we, we read that you wanted us to start at 6.30 and not at seven. And on and on and on. So we've incorporated just about everything that you have put down on this survey sheet and uh, to make this a better evening for you. Please do that. We will return the pens. <laughs> to the base. Really, that's why John Ellis is here to get all his pens back to me. <laughs> We've had Don Rozier working in this community, District 3. He just volunteers a tremendous amount of time to come and, and work with groups like ours and homeowners associations. And I've never heard this man turn down a request for speaking or from some help of some kind. So with that, Don, are you about ready? Don Rozier, ladies and gentlemen, County Commissioner for District 3. You're a County Commissioner. Thank you. I'm a little scared that uh, Jim reminded you of the survey right as I come up to speak, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll get through uh, this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, there's a lot happening in Jefferson County, and I tried to narrow it down to fit the time frame, but um, a, a couple items. I, I see uh, uh, Mayor Ellis back there. He was harassing me earlier today, uh, along with a lot of other familiar faces here for um, Leadership Evergreen. And I have to tell you, what a wonderful group of individuals. Uh, engaged people who have their community at heart. And it's a phenomenal program. Keep it up, keep it going. And um, I just love to see what, what, uh, what transpires there. Um, first and foremost, let's talk about the flood. Uh, the flood of uh, 2013. I uh, took a few pictures here and tried to overlap, but uh, the flood was um, devastating, uh, not only uh, in Evergreen, but also Coal Creek. And uh, many, many homes were damages, damaged and, and roads lost. If you look at the, uh, um, as far as the storm itself, it was a perfect storm, as they call it. A good uh, uh, cum culmination of uh, cold and hot and everything coming together, but it, it, and it dropped a tremendous amount of rain over a short, well, a short period of time and then a long, a sustained period of time. Uh, the damages, we had approximately 50 lane miles in Jefferson County of roadways that uh, were damaged. We had seven bridges um, with scour problems. We had one major culvert replacement and we were extremely fortunate that we did not have any deaths 
or injuries that were reported as a cause of or as a ramification of the floods. We had one individual who hurt himself on his ATV um, getting out, but that was just a finger, a finger injury, but I'm not counting that. <laughs> if you look at um, the, going into more of the recovery, we had the governor um, uh, contact us almost immediately for a, a state of emergency uh, and included Jefferson County in that state of emergency uh, proclamation or uh, resolution. Then he worked um, hard with the uh, federal government to get us included into the FEMA program. As you see um, with the FEMA representative here, we have been placed into the FEMA um, recovery program for both PAs and IAs. So public assistance and individual assistance. PAs are more on the uh, quasi-governmental and governmental aspect of, of improve of uh, damages. IAs, individual assessments. What I want to point out here, um, I, can't, I can't tell you how proud I am of every employee in Jefferson County, from road and bridge to sheriffs to the assessor, yes, the assessor, Lou, if he's around, to building department to human services. They, everyone stepped up and said, how can I help? Where can I be involved? Plug me in. We had road bridge crews working uh, 24 hours a day. Sheriff's Department, you know, individuals coming out of the woodwork, just coming out and helping, volunteering extra time, overtime to be there, making sure for the health, safety, and well-being of the community. It was amazing to see. Um, a couple items on here. If you haven't signed up for, uh, if you had damage or you think you have damage, Please go on to the FEMA website, contact FEMA, con go on to the Jefferson County website. Better to be safe than sorry, so please register. Even if you do not end up using any type of assistance, you have a time frame of which to register with FEMA. If you wait too long, you, you let that time pass. So please get on and register just in case. Also, uh, I won't mention them now, but I have a complete updated road list of individual roads with damages and, and expected opening dates or completion dates. Very fortunate here, uh, unlike uh, Highway 72, which is still closed, and with expectation to have uh, Highway 72 open by December 1st. So we have a lot of residents in that area that are still cut off. They can't get to their homes. Let's move... Uh, right into, and I told them I would control this and then look, I don't even flip it through. If we look at uh, some of our uh, budget challenges right now um, in, the, in the county, thank you, Kevin. The, um, what, what we're dealing with right now, as many of you have seen, uh, through since 2011, Jefferson County has seen a reduction of about 6.1% or $11.2 million in property tax revenue. And you'll see why that is important here as we go through these uh, additional slides. But also with the recession, we've seen a, a, an increase in demand, especially in human services. We have a record number of individuals coming in looking for housing assistance, looking for food assistance, looking for a, a, a wide variety of, of assistance. So as our revenues decrease, the need has steadily increased. We have, at the same time, a decline in state uh, and federal funding. Many of these come from unfunded mandates. We have a lot of programs that we have to do. We, pursuant to law, we have to do those, um, in those, those services or provide those services. However, we are not given any money from the state or federal government to do those services. So we have to manage within our budget. If you look at uh, the, the flood impacts and you look at the impacts to the county, we um, will need to absorb quite a bit of those dollars associated with the improvements that, that need to be done with the reconstruction, with the roads. FEMA will pick up about the federal government, our tax dollars, um, make up about 75%. Um, we'll need to make up the other 25%. 
that can add up really fast when you look at the total damage that has occurred. We're also, what's very, very alarming to me is we're burning through our, um, our fund balance at an alarming rate. I'm one that you have to look at a sustainable budget. We're burning through that at anywhere from 10 to 18 million dollars a year. And if we continue the same spending pace that we have in the past, we're going to run out of uh, our checking account, our savings account, everything in three years. So many changes need to be done. Um, if you look at the, the budget revenues here, but before I get into that, I see I'm already at the yellow. I apologize, but uh, the proposed budget we're looking at right now, it's a three ring binder about yay big. And uh, the proposed budget that was presented to the Board of County Commissioners by the um, county administrator has a built into it a 1.5 mil levy increase. That's a uh, property tax increase, 3% uh, merit increase for employees. And we're also doing uh, a limited business cases. Uh, associated with that. So that's what we're going through right now. Um, as you can see, the revenues coming in, um, when we're down, the property tax is a major generator of the, of the revenues that the county uses for, uses for services. So when that goes down, it affects um, all other aspects of the county. And then if you look at the overall expenses of the county, uh, primarily, most of those go through go to uh, salaries and benefits for county employees with the rest spread. Pretty typical of uh, a government or quasi-governmental agency. And then you can see the difference between the, uh, the two budgets from last year and this year. And I apologize going so quick, but I have copies. Also, want to point out with our uh, open space, uh, open space, you know, turned 40, and two weeks ago I was in this room where we had an open space volunteer breakfast. And right after the floods, I just want to point out that um, we had over 600 people from this community who called up open space and said, how can we volunteer? How can we help? That says a lot about the community. <laughs> just want to uh, point out if you need to contact us for any reason, the contact information is there. Like I said before, um, all the information uh, that I showed on the screen, I made copies, um, put them over there. Also, we had a great opportunity to be at an opening of uh, recently, and that was the opening of the Neat Trail. And it was at Bergen Park Elementary. And I tell you what, all meetings should include a whole bunch of little elementary school kids. <laughs> the energy, the excitement was phenomenal. So with that, I um, also wanted to, to point out with the watershed information, and please pick that up. And it was great being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Don, among the other speakers that are here this evening, will be on the booths and on the tables over there for you to talk to. Don, for a job that no one says thank you to you for, you do a hell of a good job. Thank you. I thank you, at least. Next comes the icon of this community. The Wyatt Earp of Evergreen. Look at him prance up here. Look at that. I, he's got his hand behind his back. I think I'm going to move on. The bank wants their pins back now. Certainly, I want to say that from every incident, there's an opportunity. And at least from the county and the sheriff's office, 
this opportunity didn't present itself in that uh, not only did we learn lessons from each and every incident, we learned what our flaws are, we learned what we need to do to become better at the next incident, but certainly uh, the flood kind of uh, helped us a little bit as well because we're not used to floods, obviously. Now, we're getting pretty used to prairie fires or wildland fires, as they call it, and, and at least managing those and knowing what to do. And, uh, but floods are a different, a different thing, so we learned a lot from the incident that, that involved uh, not only ever bring but certainly Cold Creek Canyon all the way down into our valley. that you get involved with that. But as a result of that, what I wanted to point out is uh, we had the opportunity to uh, test some of our systems in our emergency operations center and some of the people that man those uh, key points in the emergency operations center. And as a result of that, we have been able to secure some uh, state grant money that has enabled us and just opened up uh, today, as a matter of fact, what I consider a very state-of-the-art emergency operations center right in uh, Jefferson County that has uh, kind of garnered the interest of not only the state EOC, but, but other places as well. We should be proud of that fact because now we are equipped, I feel very strongly, not only technology-wise, but manpower-wise and coordination-wise to handle any event that may come our way in the future. So please keep that in mind that we're doing the best. We try to learn, we try to uh, evaluate, we try to improve every, with every incident. And I think we're, we're uh, been very successful about doing that. I, uh, you know, speaking of thoughts, I was uh, visiting my dad. Uh, he was in, in the Republic of Texas. <laughs> September. And dry, boy, it's dry down there. They wish they had that kind of rain, I'm sure. But uh, I've been working, I've been married for over 40 years, and my wife still has trouble when we go down there and visit my relatives of understanding them. <laughs> so we spent a few days down there, you know, we had to get together with all the family and stuff, and we're driving back, you know, quietly driving back, and uh, pretty soon she said, uh, can you answer one question for me? I said, yeah, what is it? She goes, why is, in Texas, police is two words and cold beer is one? <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff's Office. Uh, uh, if you've been down past the Sheriff's Office over by uh, the uh, uh, Court Administration Bill, you notice big mounds of dirt and cranes and all kinds of construction equipment. And, and uh, obviously, our facility is 25 years old, this particular the jail. And things wear out. And we identified a few years ago that we needed some some. Uh, to replace some of our infrastructure that runs the jail, the generators, the <coughs> boilers, the air exchangers, all the things that go with running uh, an operation 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the Board of County Commissioners uh, went out uh, a couple of years ago and secured some uh, funds for us to do some major construction on the Sheriff's Office campus to improve those facilities. So, We've been uh, kind of tracking through mud uh, and doing that stuff uh, as we as we get to our jobs. And as a result of that, we've had to make some, some changes to some of our uh, deployment strategies. But uh, I think when it's done, you, you, you will see that it was well worth it because you will have a state-of-the-art Sheriff's Office campus there that uh, I, I don't think we'll have to touch for many years to come. And that should be good news to you because eventually it's tax dollars. But again, we want to thank uh, the commissioners and everyone involved for securing those funds because we we had we had to we had to, add, we had to do some of those improvements. Now, I was told the last time you gave me ten extra minutes, right? So I owe you five. Okay. Well, as Jim said, this is uh, this is my last term, and, and I, I I'm going to close. We'll have a chance to answer some questions. 
at the booth, uh, manned by some of the sheriff's personnel. But um, this is my last year. Last year will be my last year in office. But I want to tell you all, because this is my community, that it has been an honor and a privilege to serve each and every one of you. And I wish that I could uh, still be a part of it, but you know, sometimes you got to live with what you got to live with. So thank you for letting me be your sheriff. God bless you all. Ted, it's really been our honor to have you on board. Now here is another person coming up to speak that has given so much to this town, so much to this county, so much to this state in her current position. And without further ado, we all know Sherry Giroux. We all know the wonderful job she does. And Sherry, come up and relate what's going on currently. So I'm shorter than Ted is, and uh, I can never live up to what he does. And God bless him, and thank you very much, Ted. Um, I, I just wanted to thank the Pathfinders. Uh, th this meeting, I mean, you started with this idea, and it's just blossomed. And those of you who are familiar with the mountain communities know that uh, Conifer has a town hall on a quarterly basis, and they usually get about 100 people or so, and they have it at the Conifer Middle School. The lights aren't as good, so I wanted to thank you for that, because I don't go into Walmart anymore because I don't look good under lights, but I don't look good. <laughs> and um, I, 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 what you're doing is fabulous, because Evergreen is is coming together as a community where we had it before, and I and think it's wonderful. Um, so I was talking to the governor week before last. In fact, uh, Don Rocher and the other commissioners and a bunch of FEMA representatives. I, I actually have my own personal FEMA representative. I don't know what to do with it, but I have one. And um, we all toured Cold Creek Canyon last last week. Is Don here? Where are you? Was, oh, there you are. Oh, how did I miss you? Um, last week? Was it last week? Yeah, and Don has a big red or a big orange jacket he wears. But, and I don't have an orange jacket. But um, the state can't afford it, but apparently the county can. Is that right? It's my jacket. Yeah, right. Well, no, and he and I have talked about that when the state comes to your door and runs. Um, so we were we went through Culver Canyon and and God bless those people and what they're going through is very difficult. Uh, so two weeks before that, I was talking to the governor and there was a group of uh, leadership in the Joint Budget Committee which I sit on. We were talking in the governor's office about whether or not we would have a special session dealing with the the floods. The floods are I cannot describe to you to you how bad it is up there. Uh, Highway 72 is it just does not exist. And when you look at when you look at bridges that were there going to people's homes and all that's left is a concrete culvert, if they're lucky. And everything has absolutely been wiped away and sides of the roads are gone and these people are completely isolated. And I do have to tell you in all sincerity, I am on a mission for peanut butter and tuna for the Whispering Pines Church. They have a, a food bank and we're trying to find that. My, my church in Rockland, we're trying to get gas cards for these people they're finding instead of a, a one hour commute if they're lucky they're now facing two and a half three hour commutes and when you've lost everything you own one gentleman had a, a an engine block in his garage and it was lifted up and carried a half a mile downstream by the force of the stream i can't describe to you how bad this was other than to say that these people are in our district, they're part of our community, and God bless them. So I was talking to the governor about whether we, we were going to have a special session, and I explained to them that we have had, if you consider the four horses of the apocalypse, which is kind of where my mind has been going lately, we've had pestilence because we have barbecue. We've had flood. We've had fire. And I'm talking about House District 25. 
And with the recession, I feel we've had famine. So that's the level that we're working at. And, and I just want to thank the county, Don and Faye and Casey, what they're doing, the commissioners, what, honestly, I make fun of Ted because God, I love him, but what the, what the sheriffs are doing, what the county employees are doing, and if we could just take a moment to say thank you because they're dealing with so much. Butter and tuna. Um, a friend of mine, I do a, week, a monthly thing out down at the Denver Rescue Mission. I know we talked about the homeless population. It's getting cold. I do uh, once a month on a Tuesday night, and I serve with uh, some other friends of mine from the mountains. Um, I personally do it for the hair net because I look good in the hair net. <laughs> um, but we're serving 350 to 400 a night down there. So. Please, as you celebrate Thanksgiving, please think of those beyond you. Um, I, Joint Budget Committee, we go back into session on November 7th. I never, I, I never stop serving because of the committee I'm serving on. You should know that as far as job growth, Colorado has finally recovered the job growth that we lost during the recession. In fact, we've actually exceeded that job growth uh, with the number of jobs from before the recession. We're adding, we've got about 60,000 more jobs in 13, 14 than we had in 12, 13. We are adding jobs about 2% per year, which is not enough to keep up with the loss, but we are adding. Colorado's doing better than most states. Um, Amendment 66, you know, everybody has their ballot. I finally filled mine out tonight because my husband was standing there with the envelope. And by the way, I apologize, Phil's not here tonight because um, he's home with our son and daughter-in-law. They're dropping off our dogs. That's, we don't have grandchildren, we just take care of dogs. And so they let me have a glass of wine and then they said, off you go. So they're having what? dinner. What? I know, I did have a glass of wine. Um, it was a red Cabernet, Rodney Strong. <laughs> so um, Amendment 66 um, is on the ballot, so is the marijuana. Um, you vote your conscience, that's what I do. Um, should Amendment 66 not pass, uh, there's $1.1 billion sitting in the state education fund because of an overage that we had from last year. And if and you all know Amendment 66 will add a billion dollars in taxes every year to K-12. So that $1.1 billion that's sitting in the state ed fund right now will be heavily competed for because K-12 will be after it. But we've also already spent $120 million of that $1.1 billion. And keep in mind, there's a thousand million in every billion, so that just gives you a concept of where we are. So, 120 million of that is being spent already on repairing the roads and bridges that we've lost during the, the storm. Uh, the medical mar or the marijuana aspect on it, and I just have to tell you, I held my nose, I looked the other direction, and I voted yes. But I'm not happy about it. I just did it. I'm sorry. I did it. Go ahead. Come get me. I. My husband said this is the ultimate sin tax. Um, so, and the wildfire commission, they had a wildfire commission this year, um, and in that wildfire commission they decided they, that they recommended to the governor that we talk about rating um, uh, our homes at a one through 10 basis, and that we also talk about a statewide building code. So when I talked to the governor about the four horses of the apocalypse, I said, Governor, we've had it. We've had floods and we've had fires in our district. We don't need more on top of us. And he said, you tell your district that I will not support a one through 10 rating system for wildfire. And I will not support <coughs> a statewide building code. So that is really important to all of us here because Colorado, historically, is a local control state. We take care of our problems at a local level. We don't let the state tell us what to do. And by that, and, and, when, we were, and when Don was complaining about his budget, I've always told the commissioners, if you see me, run, because I'm going after your money. And that's my job at the state level. 
Yeah, I did. No, actually, there was five million you could have kept. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that what the federal government does to the state, the state does the, to the counties. I'm very aware of it, and we try to find the best possible way that we can alleviate that. Part of the reason I'm on the Joint Budget Committee is because I want to make sure that I take care of all of us as best I can. Now, whenever I talk about the budget, when I when when I go home at night, my husband's had a hard day, and he looks at me, and he can't sleep, and he says, tell me about your day, honey. I'll tell him about my day, and he's out like in the pit. <laughs> so, uh, Wildfire Commission. Okay, plumbing code. The other thing I've heard is coming is they're going to talk about a statewide plumbing code. They, the next initiative that's coming through, um, and I, I can't read light up yellow, so you'll have to tell me two minutes, one minute, one minute. Okay. There's a plumbing code initiative that's coming that basically tells you how much water you can have in your toilet, how much uh, water you can have come through your faucet. They're going to base this on the California plumbing restriction code. I'm just telling you it's coming through the legislature. I will fight it, but it's coming. Uh, the other thing we've got is, of course, we know about the recall re recalls that have been going on. Personally, I don't think recalls are a good idea. I didn't approve it with Scott Walker in Wisconsin. I don't approve of recalls. I think that's what elections are for. But whatever the case, um, they're going to happen. Evie Hudak may or may not be recalled. If she is recalled, the Senate's not going to flip. They're going to make her resign. So you're not going to see a change in the election. But what you really need to do is you really need to make sure that you let your senator, Jeannie Nicholson, and you let your representative, me, know when you're not happy. I don't want to hear about it when you like something. Because don't do that to us. We need to know when you're not happy. That's what motivates us. I mean. We get so much smoke blowing up our skirt every day at the Capitol. We don't need it from you guys. Tell me when you're not happy. And I love you guys, and it's an honor to serve, and thank you very much. <laughs>